Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I'm here with a double review of two historical card games from Hall or Nothing Games, and they are 1066 Tears to Many Mothers and 1565 St. Elmo's Pay. So let's go over overall game setup. I have here a, just a basic setup for 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. 1565 St. Elmo's Pay has basically the same setup and sequence of play. So one explanation will actually apply to both games. In fact, the games are so similar that it is entirely possible to interchange factions. So in 1066, you have the Saxons and the Normans against each other. But if you want to mix things up and you have both games, you could in fact bring in the Knights of St. John or the Ottomans in against either of these two factions. That also means that if you're watching this review because you've played one game but not the other, you pretty much already know from one game whether the other one is going to work for you. But let's give a quick overview. So we're, of course we're about to talk about the solo mode, but the essence of the game is that it's a two player game where the two players are fighting for control of these wedges that are here in the middle of the board. Whoever gets two out of three of those wedges under their power at the final battle is going to win the game. There are two other ways to win, or rather I should perhaps say there's one way to win beyond this and another way to lose. So if you manage to take out your opponent's leader then you will immediately win, even if you have not reached your grand pitched battle yet, in this case, the Battle of Hastings. You could also lose if you run out of cards in your pretty hefty deck before the other player does. So card management is something that you want to pay attention to because you want to be able to hold out for longer than the other person. And even though these decks are pretty chunky, uh, that doesn't last. So you want to be aware. Um, as you play the game, you're going to progress through these objective decks. So some of the objectives are different depending on the faction that you're playing. Others are the same. So in this case, both of our decks for objectives in 1066 start with Haley's Comet. But then as you advance through, you're going through a sequence of historical events that are specific to you. And you're going to end with the Battle of Hastings. The Normans, meanwhile, have a similar setup where you're going through some specifically Norman events, but again, you will arrive at the ultimate same destination, the Battle of Hastings. One thing that makes these objectives very interesting is that you can only fight for control over a wedge at the Battle of Hastings. So you're going to spend most of your game not really thinking too hard about the wedges and just trying to get your setup really nice of your army and your cards. But you also have to pay attention to how quickly you're going through your objectives versus how quickly your opponent is. Because if you are not at the Battle of Hastings and your opponent is in terms of your position in the objective deck, your opponent is going to get a head start at pummeling you in that battle and it gives them better odds of winning. So you're going to want to kind of stay on the same course as the other person in order not to get left behind and then just completely slammed at the end. Gameplay proceeds relatively simply. You have a preparation phase where you draw cards. So you start the game with four cards in hand that you can mulligan and then you'll draw two. After that point, you'll continue to draw two cards per turn with a hand maximum of six. So you don't want to try to hold on to too much for too long. Spin those cards. There's a drafting variant if you want a little bit more control over what comes in your hand, but it means that you run through your decks a little bit faster and that is a potential end condition for the game. So be aware if that's the version that you're choosing to play. Once you've drawn all of your new cards, you're going to ready all of the cards that are in play. So when you decide to use a card for a power, you're going to to tire it, of course we would never tap it. Um, so at the beginning of the next preparation phase, it'll ready itself and you can use that card again. After you do your preparation, you'll do deployment. So let's just take a look at these lovely Norman cards. If this is a true first turn, we have six, but we're just gonna pretend that we have these five. So I can just show you different cards, what they do. So you're gonna have a mix of different types of cards. You're gonna have events, which will make something happen and then they'll disappear. You can have tactics. There's only a couple of these in the game and they actually don't come into play on the battlefield. They are put off to the side to help you. You might have units such as these Norman Axemen who go out into your wedges and do some battle for you. And you'll also have characters who have various abilities and powers as well. And these will, with your units, go into your battle formation. Each of these cards has a cost, which is right up here on the left. And they're also going to have zeal, might, and health values that help you determine whether a card survives an attack. And also when you're going for objectives, you need to be able to count the zeal and might that you have out on the board. 
This matters for objectives, and it also matters when you're trying to do damage to your enemy at the Battle of Hastings at the end of the game. So you want the right configuration of those statistics to be out in play. Some cards are also going to have this little green ribbon right here. Those are resources, and if you tire out a card for something other than an attack or an action, you might just use it for resources, and those resources are what you can use to pay for other cards that you want to put out into your formation. So one of the issues is, of course, that these cards have costs. How do you pay them? You can pay for cards by using resources or by discarding other cards to put the ones that you really want into play. So not everything that comes to your hand is going to be something that you see on the battlefield. Instead, you're gonna be choosing what goes out and then discarding the rest to make it happen. If things are getting a little bit full on your battlefield, that might cause you to sacrifice a card. So one thing that's a little bit tough to see here because I don't have the play mat is that there are basically nine spaces on each side where you can put people. So you're working with these three by three grids where you can deploy your cards. So a full battlefield can have up to nine. As you can see, we have these really chunky decks. That's because some of your guys are gonna die. It's because you're gonna sacrifice some. And also because you're using cards in your deck to pay for the cards that come out. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that you can't just put somebody back here without cards in the middle. Everyone is going to constantly be pressing up closer to this wedge. And depending on the cards that you're playing, there's some spatial considerations to keep in mind. Phase three of a turn is the wedge phase, where if you are at the Battle of Hastings, you basically count up your might and zeal in each of the wedges and compare them and do damage. Or if you're not at the Battle of Hastings, you skip the wedge phase, but you jump to the objective phase to see if either side has met an objective and needs to progress through their objective deck. So this is an overview of 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. You are trying to either destroy the enemy leader, take two out of three wedges, or just outlast the other person in terms of deck economy. You're going to be placing cards out here that give you resources to put out more cards, that take actions, that have reactions. You can cause events. And what you're doing is you're trying to maintain your good position, weaken them, and get ready to win one way or another. Just so you can look at the 1565 St. Elmo's pay cards, I'm gonna switch these out and then we can talk about solo mode. So here's a basic solo setup for 1565 St. Elmo's pay. I'm gonna be set up as the Ottomans and then I'm playing against the foe who could be set up as either side. But this time my enemy is the Knights of St. John and their commander is Jean Pariso de Valette. So basically what's gonna happen is that play proceeds as normal for me but there's a bot that runs the solo. So as you can see, the solo starts with a full column behind one of the wedges. Uh, that's just so that it's not too easy for me as the solo player who's sentient to knock out the leader and thus end the game. The rules are basically the same. You either win by knocking out the leader or you win by conquering two out of three of the wedges when you finally get to the Siege of Malta. So the the crowning moment in the last game was the Battle of Hastings. This one is leading up through the objective decks to the Siege of Malta. The only difference is that I can still lose by running out of cards, but the bot, the enemy, cannot run out of cards. So that changes a little bit of the gameplay because you can't just try to time your opponent out if you are playing solo. So my turns are still gonna work as normal. You prepare, you deploy, there's a wedge phase if you're in that final moment and you check for objective completion. So the faux turn involves going through a couple of different checks to see what it should do. So first you check if you, the human player, have sacrificed a card at some point during your turn. If you did, then they're gonna skip their turn. So sacrifice can have some strategic value for the human player. If you did not, then you're gonna check the next thing on the list. So the next thing on the list is they're gonna make a single artillery or range attack if they have cards out there that have the artillery, which is a 1565 term or a range, which is a 1066 term card out on the board. So basically if they can hit you from a distance, they will. And then if they don't have any artillery or range attacks that are ready to go, then you draw a card from their deck and you play it. So there's a system for how you would do that. First, you're gonna check your game around. So there's a wheel that you turn through that gives the enemy accelerating resources throughout. So this is how you track not only how many resources they have, what turn you're on, and yes, you can adjust your difficulty all the way up to king level. Whoa. All right, so let's say we're, we're a turn in and we're gonna figure out how to play a card. Um, basically what will happen is you look at the resources that are available to them. That includes these green ribbons. So the more of these cards with the green ribbon on them are out, the, uh, the more resources they'll have plus whatever's on the dial. So this negative one would cancel out 
the positive one that's already on the board, leaving the bot with zero resources. However, there are zero resource cards. So what happens is you're going to actually mill through the deck until you find one of those zero resource cards for the enemy to deploy. So you're gonna pull the top card of the foe deck. This is one resource and I have zero resources. I know that there's zero resource cards in here, so I'm gonna to have to mill through the deck in order to find it. So this one didn't work, so I've discarded it and then I'm just gonna draw another one. Nope, 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 nope. Ah, we have a tactic, stout armor. So we would pull this one and the enemies are allowed to use a tactic. So we would put that on their side. For cards that go into the actual battle setup, uh, there is an order of priority. So basically it'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And instead of pushing cards up to fill gaps when cards are removed, destroyed, the enemy is going to instead just be able to have gaps in its formation where you are not allowed to do that. If there's an action on a card that you play, the foe is gonna take that action immediately and there are also orders of priority for cards on your side that the foe might choose to attack. At the end of the round, when you pass, your foe gets a chance to maybe place another card among other things. So first it will tire each of its artillery cards to use the ability. If it has range cards, it'll do the same thing next. Then it'll activate any end of round abilities that it has. It'll draw and play one more card and then you move the resource dial. So at the end of your turn, the foe does a whole bunch more stuff than you might have expected <laughs> until you actually read the rules. That said, there are a lot of things that the foe won't do. So you ignore a lot of the special actions and discounts and other, and other interesting text twists that are on the cards when you're operating the bot. You also do play your objectives as normal, but when you destroy an objective card, you ignore the special text when you are playing solo. That is how solo play pretty much works for both 1066 and 1565. In 1066, you have to use the rule book to track resources instead of this lovely dial. And essentially for the solo player, you're gonna play like normal, and you're gonna have to anticipate and deal with the bot. I wanna start off by saying that I think that as a work of historical appreciation, both 1066 and 1565 are great. There's a lot of research that clearly went into these games. They include all kinds of fun little historical events, such as, you know, launching severed heads or, you know, inserting important historical characters in where you can actually enjoy their presence. And the historical research is backed up by the fact that even the objective cards, when they're played in order, are meant to reflect actual historical progress and the art really supports the historical excellence of these games. It is really, really beautiful, really striking, and is clearly meant to truly capture the flavor of the events that these games are about. So as works of history made board game, I really appreciate both. I also think that I would enjoy these games as two player games. I have not played either one with a human opponent yet, but I think that that would provide a very different game and then it would be a richer experience. That said, even though I wanted to love these games tremendously, I do not think that the solo mode is good enough to carry them. I could see you playing this game solo if you bought it to play two player and you just wanted to pass some time or you really craved a game, but I would not buy this game just to play it solo. And let me explain why. Part of it is that I don't think that the solo mode runs very smoothly. Uh, as you notice from the, the gameplay demo, you have to mill through the deck to find cards to put out on the board for the AI, for the foe. And honestly, doing that repeatedly, sometimes twice a turn, is not fun. Also, because the foe puts cards onto the battlefield in very set ways, it really takes away what I think must be some of the tension of deciding how to build up your own forces in response to what someone else is doing, in response to how they're strategically moving cards that they really like out of the way. None of those things happen in solo mode. And because you ignore so many of the actions on the cards in order to make the bot work, I actually think you might be missing a lot of flavor of the main two player game. Lots of cards, special abilities, special text on the objective cards that you carry out when you destroy one. None of those things are really present in solo. And I actually think that that is a loss and not one that the solo mode in this form can make up for. So that said, it's not that solo mode doesn't work. It's perfectly functional, 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a ripper in good time. And with so many incredible solo games out on the market, I just don't see how 1066 and 1565 are able to compete in that arena. If you're looking for a Hall or Nothing game that has that same great art, but you want a better solo experience, I might choose something like Gloom of Killforth, which I will be reviewing in the near future. So that said, I think that Tristan Hall has designed two very thoughtful, lovely games in terms of their historicity, and I do suspect that the two-player experience could be very fun. That said, I'm a solo reviewer, I do solo-specific reviews, and while the one-player mode for 1066 and 1565 is functional, it's not exciting the way that I want my solo modes to be. So for that, I'll rate both of these games a 6 out of 10. Thanks for watching, and happy gaming.